Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson from the Aspen Institute, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome all of you here this evening. I think now that we've been doing events like this over, Linda, Jamie, how long has it been now? Three years. It's, it's really becoming a, a, a Aspen family in New York. Uh, some of you I've seen at many of these, others, this is the first time I've seen you, and I hope many of you will uh, become regulars. We're expanding our presence in New York, I'm delighted to say, not just with these wonderful events, but with other ones. As a matter of fact, we have our first New York Ideas uh, program next week. For those of you who know the Aspen Ideas Festival in Aspen, we're doing something on a somewhat smaller scale uh, here in New York at the New York, New York Historical Society next Tuesday night and Wednesday. And even though it's, it's sold out, for those of you here in the family, if you're interested, you can talk to me or Jamie afterwards, and I'm sure we can find a way to sneak you in. Uh, but it's, it's, as I said, great to have you all here at uh, our home away from home, this magnificent uh, and historic house. Uh, I want to thank Jennifer Rabb of Hunter College for making this uh, available. Uh, we couldn't have a better venue in New York, given the values that we have at the Aspen Institute, than this uh, uh, splendid home of uh, Sarah Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, and of course, this program is part of another wonderful uh, uh, and larger program, uh, which is the series of conversations that we have about great leadership, conversations in honor of the late Preston Robert Tisch. Uh, a, a man who made incredible contributions uh, to the country, especially, of course, to this city, a leader in business, a leader in philanthropy, uh, a leader in sport. And that leadership in philanthropy has been carried on splendidly uh, by his children, uh, by, by Steve Tisch, by Lizzie and Jonathan Tisch, and of course, by Lori Tisch, and also now, especially uh, through the generosity of the Lori M. Tisch Illumination Fund. Uh, we have two wonderful friends of the Aspen Institute whom we're gonna be listening to, and it's my pleasure to turn things over to Lori to introduce them and have a few words. Thank you, Elliot. Um, on behalf of my family, thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another program in the Aspen Institute Leadership Series, Conversations with Great Leaders in Memory of My Father, Preston Robert Tisch. As Elliot said, Aspen Institute developed this new New York City-based program to challenge our thinking by gathering leaders and journalists to engage in dialogue about regional and national issues on business, activism, and public service government, journalism, philanthropy, and healthcare, the arts, and sports. All topics my father would have loved discussing. I actually, actually often think of this series as something similar to his beloved Regency Power Breakfast, only without the $10 orange juice. Um, <laughs> you've had it. Um, among the innovative leaders who have been a part of Aspen's leadership series are Newark Mayor Cory Booker, artist and actor Anna DeVere Smith, J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, and sports greats Billie Jean King and Marc Messier. Tonight, I am so pleased, pleased to introduce another such individual, my good friend and someone for whom I have the utmost admiration and respect, Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee. Sid is the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning Tour de Force, now I'm quoting Amazon, Tour de Force, The Emperor of All Maladies, and is a professor of medicine at Columbia University and staff physician at Columbia's Medical Center. In his spare time, Sid travels to art shows with his wife, Sarah Z, the recipient of a 2003 MacArthur Genius Grant and the artist recently chosen to represent the United States at the 2013 Biennale. I have read Sid's book and urge all of you to do so so that you will understand why this biogra biography as cancer has been called a gripping page turner. Now think about that, a biography of cancer called a gripping page turner. That's quite an accomplishment. Now I'm gonna quote again from Amazon. Mukherjee is like a kaleidoscope. At first look, you experience him as a writer of page turning stories. Turn him another way, and he's a highly effective communicator of cellular biology. Turn him a third time, you get superb science writing. Turn him a fourth time, he is the grandeur and broad sweep of an excellent historian. 
If only I had read his book in my teens, I would have found my life's career. And another quote, and finally the quest for the cure is the basis of all science and research. And Dr. Mukherjee's written a superb tone in language that we can all attempt to understand. Cancer always be with, will always be with us. Dr. Mukherjee hopes that we can outwit this devil and survive. With one out of every two, one out of every three females and one out of every two males in the United States afflicted by this dreadful disease, I think it is accurate to say that just about every person in this room has had a direct experience with cancer themselves or with a close family member or friend. It is cl clear that the war on cancer is far from over and the work and influence of people like Sid is more crucial than ever. I'm also in, pleased to introduce another friend and a spin mate, although it seems to be working much better for her, <laughs> <laughs> Katie Kirk, one of television's most respected and beloved journalists. So why Katie? Well, about three months ago, I had a dinner and, with Sarah and Sid, and we were talking about uh, this event. And we said, so who should we get to moderate? And Sid said, do you think we could get Katie Kirk? That would be so perfect. There was only one and, <laughs> and we did. Um, as, as you all know, Katie has been a key journalist on every major network and has held countless candid in-depth interviews with, newspapers from the, with newsmakers from the worlds of business, politics, medicine, and entertainment. But she is equally renowned for her tireless and extremely successful work as an advocate for Stand Up to Cancer and as co-founder of the National Colorectal Cancer Research Alliance. And as always, many, many thanks to the Aspen Institute leadership and staff. As I say every time, my father would be so proud and honored by this series. And of course, to Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb for hosting this terrific program at Roosevelt House. It is now my very great pleasure and honor to give the, give the floor to Sid and Sarah. And Katie. Sarah. <laughs> Whoa. Sarah, too. <laughs> Sarah, who? OK, thanks, Lori. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you, Lori. We're both, Sid and I are both honored to be here to um, pay tribute to your wonderful dad as a part of this series. And I'm going to try to show the many sides of Sid. Uh, and I'm not going to say Sid's last name because I'm sure to bungle it. So I think we're on a first name basis. So I wanted to start, you know, I, I do want to actually talk about your humanistic side and your writer side and your science side. But I wanted to start by just giving people a bit of background on you, Sid. You went to Stanford. Uh, you went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, then to Harvard Medical School. So you're a classic underachiever. Why did you decide? Why did you, all my safety schools, by the way? <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. So why why did you decide to go into oncology? What was it that drew you to that field? Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for hosting this. Um, thank you, Laurie for allowing this to happen, and, um, uh, um, and it's a wonderful forum. I, the, my interest in oncology really came from the reverse in some sense. Um, I was in England, um, and I had the opportunity to do a, a PhD, and I thought I would do a PhD in immunology. This was a time when we were just beginning to understand the immune system um, in a way that we now understand much more clearly. And there was one person at Oxford, um, Alan Townsend, who I'd never met. Um, and I uh, picked up, I was an undergraduate, uh, and I knew I was going to Oxford. I picked up the phone, and Alan doesn't have a secretary. This is a great thing not to, not to have in life. Never have a secretary. Because he picked up the phone himself, and we had a conversation. And I said, you know, I'm really interested in what you're doing. And he said, well, come and work with me. Because Alan had solved a very important problem in immunology, which is actually very relevant to cancer. We want to come back to that. And the problem is called the inside-out problem, which is, it's such a simple idea, which is if viruses, like cancer-causing viruses, live inside cells, how can the immune system look at this, at this thing? If a virus is inside the cell and the immune system is outside, how can a virus, how can the immune system ever find a cell that's infected by a virus? You could, you, you could, you could, you, you could be taking a walk on the river and you would ask yourself this question. Alan was taking a walk on the river one morning, and he asked himself this question, how on earth could the immune system see viruses? Because these, they're hidden inside. Because the they're cell. hidden inside. Um, and Alan solved the inside-out problem. 
uh, for which he got numerous awards. But he solved the inside-out problem. It turns out that the immune system, <laughs> Advil. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> and saves. <you> know? <laughs> exactly. Alan solved the inside-out problem by showing that, in fact, the, the, every cell chews up pieces of virus and presents them to its outside surface, like little flags. And the immune system, we've evolved, actually sponges evolved to do this. Um, and, and, and so he solved this problem. And so when I went to Alan's lab, I asked the flip question, which, is called, which I call the outside-in question, which is, if that's the case, why aren't we eliminating cancer viruses? Why is it that you know, human papillomavirus, which is associated with cervical cancer, or hepatitis B virus, you know, if that's the case, influenza goes away from our bodies. Why does hepatitis B not go away, right? So I focused on a particular virus, and I was looking at cells, being a cell biologist, and then something clicked in me, and I, and I want to talk about that click. Something clicked in me, and I think it's the most amazing thing that can happen to a scientist. Something clicked in me, and, 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 and it was the idea that, the, that there's more to it than cells. There are human beings from whom the cells are coming. There is Henrietta Lacks, who was a human being from whom the cells came. So, and so I sort of backed into oncology, you know, looking at the microscope and then sort of backing up from the microscope until I thought that I'd become a clinical oncologist, um, and that was my, my particular journey. Um, I know that writing this book was prompted by a question from a patient of uh -huh. yours who said, uh, I'm gonna, I think who had stomach cancer, I believe, uh -huh. who said, I'm going to keep fighting this disease, but I really need to know what it is I'm fighting. And people have often asked me, what exactly is cancer? What causes it? And I know that you can give an, expl an explanation that's quite distilled and, and simple. Mm -hmm. um, so before you, t you tell us about the, the patient and, and how she motivated you to really look at the history of cancer, how would you describe what happens? And then I'll tell you how I describe it, but you describe it first. Okay, um, I'll go first, you go second. <laughs> uh, cancer is a, an illness of ab the abnormal growth, the dysregulated growth of cells. Um, this growth is caused uh, typically, not always, but typically caused by the, very, by, by the dysregulation of the very same genes that control normal growth. In other words, the very genes that allow our embryos to grow, our hands to grow, our heads to grow, if th their job is to allow cells to grow and to put brakes on cells when they stop growing, cancer is a dysregulation of that process. So it's like a cell, uh, cell division out of control. That is correct. Uh, it is a cell division out of control. Um, and in doing so, it also, cancer cells also evolve. So it's an evolving cell division out of control. The evolution is very critical. It makes it unlike any disease that we know in, in, in physiology and perhaps in history. Because cancer is, as someone described it, cancer is like watching Darwin's Galapagos Islands inside your body. Because the cells are evolving constantly in real time. Right. Um, and that's what makes it an incredible challenge. Right. And I know that as somebody, that's pretty much how I describe it to you. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I always say it's a series of DNA or sur sort of screw-ups, yep. and ultimately everybody has sort of cancer in their body, right? But the P53 tumor suppressor gene uh -huh. is the final thing that quashes it. So you have to have a whole series of things that are going awry right. before the cells start to divide and take over your body, yes, right? Yes, that's exactly right. I also say, often say that it's like, you know, people think of cancer as this monolithic enemy. And I always say it's like a thousand, well, probably a million different diseases and a million different biologies. And I know that's something that you talk about in the book as well, right? Right. And it's a very important, uh, it's a very important uh, point, uh, which is that the genes that control the growth of breast cells are somewhat different, not, not all completely different, than the genes that control the growth of prostate cells or the genes that control the growth of skin cells in melanoma, right? They're similar, but somewhat different. Every organ has its own set of controls. And when you have cancer in those organs, typically these organ-specific genes are the ones that are being screwed up. But on the flip side, I think we also have to be careful, and this goes back, and this very, very soon becomes an incredibly important political question. We also have to be careful to over-silo cancer. There's a, there's a feeling in the advocacy community, and some ends of the advocacy community, that one dollar given to breast cancer is one dollar taken away from prostate cancer. Well, I give the example that, in fact, we have learned more about breast cancer from prostate cancer than from any other cancer in 
in, one could make the argument we learn more about breast cancer, prostate cancer, than even breast cancer itself. Because the, only, the, the whole idea of using hormonal therapy really comes, there's a crossover idea that comes, I, I trace this in my book. Who would have thought that hormones could be used in this particular way to cross over from prostate cancer into breast cancer? But Charles Huggins did uh, in Chicago. He, he figured this out. And so uh, we have to be a little bit resistant as we move ahead uh, in, in, in making too many silos at the same time. But, but also, Sid, about the, the different biologies. In other words, not only can you not have a one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. treatment for all different kinds of cancers, but each individual may respond differently. And Absolutely. I always, you know, when my husband was sick and we were, he was having chemotherapy, um, I always felt like it was so primitive, even this was 14 years ago, that doctors sort of threw something against the wall to see what would stick, that they couldn't really determine how a patient would respond. And even if a patient is responsive, it's often very short-lived. Yes. You know, this response rate is very misleading for people who have cancer because you're like, yay, I responded. And then, as Sid said, it's so clever and so, uh, you know, really demonic in its ability to morph into something that's more effective than the cancer. Right. That, sorry, than the treatment, rather. Um, it's very frustrating. Yes. But I forget what I was going to ask you. But anyway, so, so, it, so it's, people respond very differently to the treatments, mm -hmm. right? So that's why personalized medicine is so exciting in terms of the wave of the future. It is extremely exciting, but we have, to, again, a, a, a note of caution about personalized medicine. It is impossible to personalize medicine to every person. Uh, th there's a kind of, uh, there's a semantic crisis in, in, in describing that. There are 600,000 men and women who will die of cancer in the United States. I will guarantee you that every human being sitting in this audience today has already had a first degree relative who has experienced cancer in their lifetimes. And I would guarantee you that we will, in, we will this will continue. Uh, this is not someone else's problem. This is our problem. Um, so if you cannot invent 600,000 individual medicines to address the 600,000 variants of cancer that are causing cancer deaths, so what then is that line? It's a very subtle line between over-personalized, we can't personalize every piece of it. How does one appreciate the diversity of cause and in cancer but still remain true to the idea that you could still create groups of medicines that work for groups of people. Um, and that's a big question. You know, um, you were talking about sort of the cross-pollinization of, say, prostate cancer treatment and breast cancer. And, you know, I want to talk about the history of cancer, but just on that subject, do you think one of the most exciting areas, and Sid and I talked about this on the phone, is that these therapies are becoming less organ specific. Yes, I it's think really it's more about how a cancer so. behaves or what kind of protein it may be secreting. So there can be uh, therapies for different kinds of cancer from the same thing. Like I did a story on a girl who had a childhood brain tumor down at, in Philadelphia at CHIP, I think. Uh -huh. And then chop. this chop, 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 right? Children's Hospital, yeah, yeah. Of Philadelphia. What and the, this, the same treatment for melanoma. Yes because it had to do with the hedgehog pathway, yes. is that right? Yep. Whatever that means. But it was basically the same treatment was being used for these two cancers. And I think you're seeing that more and more, more, and more. right? Absolutely. Well, actually, it goes back. The woman who inspired Emperor of All Maladies, the woman who inspired the book, had a gastrointestinal stroma tumor. I call it a stomach cancer. But really, it was a kind of sarcoma. Now, under the microscope, a gastrointestinal strom stroma tumor, a GIST, or GIST as we call them, looks nothing like a leukemia. It behaves nothing like a leukemia. This is a solid tumor that grows in the abdomen, typically. It presents with these fox eye cells, these spindle-shaped cells. The pathologists have beautiful words uh, for very ugly diseases, but fox eye is a, is a, is a word that often is used, spindle-shaped cells. Looks nothing like the blood cancer called chronic myelogenous leukemia. But in the 1990s, scientists, re researchers discovered that this form of gastrointestinal stroma tumor, which this lady had, but Germain had, shares a gene, a cousin gene, with that leukemia. And in fact, Glivec, imatinib, treats both of them. 
Now, if you were, if you did not understand the genetic anatomy of cancer, you would never imagine that there was a relationship between those, these two tumors, one of the solid tumor, tumor of the other tumor of the blood, which seem to have nothing to do with, with each other except they share cousin genes. Melanoma, great example, right? Looks like very unique, doesn't have any relationship with other cancers, but in fact, some melanomas are related actually to that same gastrointestinal stromal tumor gene. Some melanomas are related to lung cancer. So it's as if the entire, imagine the human, the human anatomy is being reorganized, not in terms, because cancer is a genetic disease, not in terms of organs, but in terms of genes. And imagine now you can re reimagine a human being as these, as sharing these organs, sharing these pieces of genetic information, as it were. Which is really exciting. It is and exciting. I, I know when the, when the patient that we refer to said, I want to know what I'm treating, you realized you didn't know how to answer her question. And so you embarked on this book. And, and I think in the book, you say the first mention of cancer is, I think it's 1600 BC. Uh -huh. Is that right? And Correct, yeah. it was on, a, a, on papyrus. And it was described as some kind of breast tumor. Uh -huh. And then under treatment, it said none. Yes. But then you mentioned, Sid, in, in the book that for something like 2,000 years after that, cancer wasn't even mentioned, not only in medical literature, but yes. in any kind of literature. It, it vanishes. Why? We don't know exactly why, uh, but we suspect that the rise of cancer incidence becomes very relevant today. The rise of cancer incidence has to do with a changing in the age structure of the population. People didn't live long enough to get cancer. Um, they died of smallpox and typhoid and typhus and various other things, tuberculosis, um, well into the early part of the 19th century. In some ways, it is, it is the fact that we have now lifted these, you, you know, I, I say in the book, cancer is, cancer is revealed in the double negative. When the killers are killed, it is what remains. Um, now, there are two, two important points to be made about that. One point is a point that I often make, which is make no mistake that although cancer is an age-related disease, that it does not affect people of all ages. If you take, if you take just the men and women under 50 in this country who will die of cancer every year, you still have hundreds of thousands of patients. These people will, young men and women under 50, right? So, so there is an age-relatedness to it, but it's not only age-related. So now the second point is that, in fact, what we're finding out is that Cancer in the elderly behaves somewhat differently than cancer in young men and women. We Isn't don't know why. Isn't cancer in, in younger people generally more aggressive? It is generally more aggressive, but more treatable. Uh, in the elderly, it's generally more indolent and less treatable. I mean, it's a big conundrum. We don't know why. Now, that's a very general principle. Isn't it principle. because as you age, your cells divide less rapidly or something? Is that have something to well, do with it? Well, so there is one explanation for it, and it's, um, it's an interesting explanation. Uh, let me go through it because it's actually, it, it, it lends to a very particular, very, very interesting form of thinking. Um, and it goes back to your question, which is uh, cancer, one of the reasons, we, you could ask a simple question, much like Alan Townsend walking on, down the river, you could ask yourself, why aren't we bursting with cancer all the time? What, what, what is it that prevents us, all of us sitting here, from growing cancer cells all the time? And there are several answers to this question. One, one answer is that the immune system is doing something to uh, regulate uh, the, the uh, appearance of cancers. But perhaps the most, one, one of the most striking answers to this question was provided by several researchers, but among them Bert Vogelstein uh, at Johns Hopkins, who uh, in a series of extremely important seminal papers in the 1980s and 1990s figured out that cancer, not, you, don't need, you, can't, you, you, don't, you, you can't get to cancer by mutating just one gene. You need many, many genes on the order of 10, 12, 15 genes, 15 of these growth regulatory genes to be mutated before you get to cancer. So in other words, ultimately, when a cancer becomes a cancer, it has accumulated not one change in DNA, not one mutation, but about 10 or 15, and maybe even more, hundreds in some cases. Now, the theory is that in childhood cancers, the genes that are mutated are big, ugly genes. Uh, so these are genes that have large control of growth processes. And so it's death by, not to not overuse the metaphor, by a large strike. Whereas in adult cancers, particularly cancer in the elderly, it is many, many, many small gene mutations. So it's death by 100 cuts. Mm. Now what's interesting about it is that in general, if you have a car and the axle of the car breaks, you can generally fix that car. 
because you can fix the axle. On the other hand, if you have a car and there are 15 pieces of the car that are broken, small pieces, like the battery is broken and the speedometer doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera, that's a much harder fix. So that is one explanation, a theoretical explanation to the conundrum of why children's cancers may be easier to treat than adult cancers, but it's a theoretical explanation. Not to mention that elderly people have a harder time tolerating the, no, this the is often toxic, yeah, yeah. scorched body treatments absolutely, that are, yes. you know, were used for so long. You know, you talked about in the book in, in the 1950s, I thought this was so interesting, uh, that a woman tried to take out a classified ad in the New York Times to find a breast cancer support group. Mm -hmm. And the editor at the time said, this was in the early 50s, we can't say the word breast or cancer in the paper. How about disease of the chest wall? Yes. And um, I call it death by euphemism. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but I'm, I'm just curious, when and why did cancer become such a taboo subject? I mean, people, I know that many people have relatives. They want to get their family history, but they don't even know, A, if a relative yes. died of cancer, or B, specifically where, with, where the primary tumor was, yes. because doctors just didn't give that kind of information to patients, and there was an element of shame A about very the, strong disease, element of shame, the yeah. disease. And where did that come from? Was it because how hopeless it seemed for it was so, primary, so long? It was, it was the shame that comes from nihilism, really. It was the shame that comes from being unable to do anything. Um, it's the, it's, you know, uh, I interviewed, actually, for my book, I interviewed a very, one of the very moving interviews was from a palliative care nurse who had worked in the 60s. And she said to me, actually, a, a line that, I, 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 that really struck me, I, struck me uh, almost, I was so moved by the line. She said, doctors were allergic to the smell of death. Um, they were so, <coughs> so hopeful that, and, and when, when, they, when they couldn't succeed, you, you had, you, you, the patient had failed. I mean, we still, I mean, I still, we still in, 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 in the vocabulary of cancer say pa the patient has failed chemotherapy. Obviously, in fact, the patient has not failed chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, chemotherapy has right. failed the patient. But, uh, but, but in fact, we still say, use the word failure um, in, in a clinical context. Um, and so this idea of failure, what does it mean to fail, um, makes you embarrassed, uh, makes people embarrassed. There's a, there's a line in the, in the book which is, which is, is uh, buried in somewhere of a woman, you know, Cecily Saunders, uh, the, the physician nurse who invented the discipline of palliative care. Um, and I, I point out in the book, it, it was no less an invention than an inhibitor for BRAF. You know, it required no less ingenuity, no less daring to invent palliative care in the face of this kind of medicine uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Cecily Saunders quotes in her book, and I picked, picked it up, actually it's the title of a whole section of my book, a woman who says to her doctor, a woman with breast cancer in England, who says to her doctor, will you turn me out if I don't get better? Um, if, I, if I'm not responding to the chemotherapy, will you throw me out of the hospital? And this was a common question. If I don't respond, am I a reject? Am I a pariah? Um, and hence the shame. Uh, hence the, the idea that, you know, we'd rather not look at the smell of death. We'd rather not smell the smell of death and so forth the same. Similarly, you talked about this in a, an article in The Guardian, which is something that really sticks in my craw, and I'm so glad you addressed it, Sid, which is the whole notion that a positive attitude helps you deal with cancer. Because nothing bugs me more yes. than to hear people say that. Now, that's not to say it's not helpful, yes. that it's not psychologically uplifting, but I always say cemeteries are full of people who had the will to live. Yes. But their biology just wasn't working. Yes, exactly. The biology yeah. and the treatment just did not come together and, and give them. It's too glib, this it's idea. Just so it's just annoying. too glib, and it's too simplistic. It's too naive. Uh, it, you know. But that's a very common sort of attitude. Oh you know, yeah, I yeah. think perpetrated. Even though I have so much admiration for Lance Armstrong, I felt like his sort of whole. Deal. I wanted to say, well, testicular cancer is one of the most curable cancers, by yes. the way, and not that I don't admire his tenacity and yes. and drive, but it just I think it does such a disservice to yes. people who are dealing with the disease and their families to suggest that someone didn't have a positive enough it's attitude or a will to live. It is an unbelievably paternalistic thing to say. Uh, imagine someone saying it to you, you know. Imagine and and it is an incredible. It it, it really it reiterates a kind of medieval paternalism about medicine, which is, you know, it's all in your mind anyway. 
you know, you're hysterical because you know, something's wrong with your uterus. Right. Uh, the kind of the classical medieval explanation. Okay. I'm glad I got that off my chest, thank <laughs> you. Okay, so one of the things that you talk about is how, I mean, the, the history of cancer is so fascinating. Obviously, we can't deal with all of it here tonight, although I wish we could, because I could talk to Sid for hours. But one of the things you talk about is in the first half of the 19th century, how primitive the surgery was and how primitive the treatments were, right. and specifically mastectomies, which is, is more is, is, more is better. better. Yeah. yeah. And tell us a little bit about that and where that thinking came from and how it got so out of control. Yes. Well, the, the story goes back to, it actually goes back to the 16th and 17th centuries. And it, it is also a story of frustration and shame. Um, and it was very simply that surgeons, by the, certainly by the early 19th century, had learned to operate, technically had learned to operate and remove cancer from the breast, from the stomach. Um, but they didn't know what to do with relapses. Women would still relapse uh, with breast cancer. And Charles Moore, uh, a surgeon, had actually created a kind of uh, dartboard in which, uh, a drawing, as it were, of mapping the position of the relapses and found that many of the relapses with women were local relapses. They were relapsing at the site of surgery. And this idea that, that, that the reason that cancer was not being cured was because there was local relapse took, essentially ignited the world of cancer. It took fire. Um, and it, it appeared on a man who was uh, somewhat, he was gunpowder to that fire, and that's William Halstead. Halstead was, is probably still the most technically ac accomplished surgeon in surgical history. He invented the discipline. Um, he was a masterful surgeon at Hopkins. Uh, he, among other things, um, had experimented with using cocaine as an anesthetic uh, while he was in, 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 in Europe, and in, in, a week's, in a couple of weeks' time had become addicted to cocaine. But it was all secret. This was all completely silent and secret. Uh, the treatment for cocaine at that point in time was uh, to give them morphine. Um, so he became addicted to morphine and cocaine. Um, but in Just the, the kind of doctor you want to have <laughs> on your side, right? But he was so unbelievably disciplined uh, that we know from records that he would essentially perform operations dosing himself on cocaine and morphine so that he could have the perfect control. And he did. He was an amazing innovator. But he took this theory, this idea that more, that we aren't curing cancer because we aren't cutting enough cancer away to its nth limit, to its technolo technological limit, but to its also to its intellectual limit. And unfortunately, it didn't work. It, it, he kept trying. He, but he the moved. mastectomies were not just, for, I, mean, I mean, he removed ribs. People were, I mean, really, I mean, not even disfiguring, almost dismembering, beyond, yeah, right? I mean, practically. Yeah. Um, tell us about some of the pivotal figures that most impressed you. Obviously, not that guy in all ways, but um, mm -hmm. that I know you talk about Sidney Farber, for example, and he's a real hero to you in uh -huh. terms of the war on cancer, which we can talk about after that, about Richard Nixon and that whole declaration. But why was Sidney Farber so impressive? And maybe you can share with everyone how he started the Jimmy Fund, which is still very vibrant today. Uh -huh. Well, Sidney Farber has. Sidney Farber's role in the history of cancer, he has two roles, and that's what's interesting to me. He has a role as a physician, an inventor of uh, one of the earliest forms of chemotherapy uh, for childhood leukemia, a disease. If you had childhood leukemia in 1950, you were guaranteed that you, 100 percent of the children would die. Uh, by 1960s, that number was about 40 percent. Now the number is about 10 percent. So uh, it is a remarkable progress in that particular variant of leukemia, child leukemia. Um, Farber stimulated that by creating the first chemotherapy uh, mm -hmm. through a series of discoveries, uh, 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 helping found the chemotherapy for leukemia. But Farber's role in this history is not as a chemotherapeutic doctor. There are many people who did similar things. Farber's role is, his, is, is in what I call the, his second invention, his transition which is he, dis he began to realize by the 1950s and certainly by the 1960s that cancer needed something more. And that was a political platform. That the voice of Fanny Rosenau, the woman who couldn't write to the New York Times to talk about breast cancer, had to become a non-silent voice. That had to become a voice that we could all hear. And it was the, it was the voice of, as we now know, it was the voice of one in every three women. Uh, one in every two men. So 
that voice had to be heard. And so Farber beca began to become what I call a political scientist, in which he, he came out of the laboratory, out of his little burrow. He had, a, he had a room which was no bigger than maybe this corner at the bottom of uh, the, what is now the Children's Hospital in, in Boston, and began to go to Washington. Mr. Farber went to Washington, and he began to create a platform. Uh, and he had the legitimacy to do so. And he li liaised with, among other people, Mary Lasker. Uh, and and they, they, they formed a partnership. What was great about him, too, is I think he became a master marketer of cancer. Absolutely. Because he understood that you had to personalize the disease. So he had a patient who was a little boy, you know, sort of a poster child of an adorable little boy who had a strange name, like <laughs> Iken or something. Yes. So he was, everything was perfect about this child except his name. His name was Einar Gustafsson. Yeah, that's it. And uh, he was from Maine. He was, from, uh, he was he a child of Swedish immigrants from, from Maine. And, and so Farber said, you know, Einar Gustafsson Fund for Cancer. <laughs> so he called him Jimmy. Um, and, so, and, and that's the Jimmy Fund. He, right. he, was, he understood this idea. Farber, almost, almost instinctually, uh, with an almost an animal instinct, he understood that for cancer to become a national, uh, uh, to have a national voice, it needed these kinds of icons. Um, he had learned actually from the polio campaign. Um, he had learned where he had studied very intensely, he had studied the polio campaign and figured out the March of Dimes and he figured it out, he would mapped it out, much like a scientist maps out uh, a pathway. Uh, he, you can see his sort of the cogs of his brain working in the 1950s. You can see the working with Mary Lasker in the 1950s, figuring out how do we make this happen. And this was really the, the first intersection of science, philanthropy, and advocacy. Exactly. exactly. That really it had set the stage before, yeah. for future I mean, it generations. happened with polio. Uh, right. It had happened a little, uh, it happened with polio because. In cancer, I guess. In cancer, yeah. yes. But, but, but really, it was one of the first. Uh, even, you know, e even in that world, it was one of the first. Um, how. There's, uh, I wanna, there's so many things I want to ask Sid, but let's talk about environmental factors only because I'm kind of obsessed with that right now. And in terms of cancer, things that cause cancer, um, what, why has there been such, so little research on things in the environment, whether you're talking about pesticides or food additives or uh, cell phones and things like that? Obviously, they're working to try to make some kind of connection if there is in fact a connection. Probably isn't. Uh huh? Probably is not. Probably yeah. is not. Because it, the radio frequency is so yeah, low. Just, it, it, I don't it, know, when my cell phone gets really hot and it's right up, I think I'm getting a brain tumor. Yeah. <laughs> but no? No. Okay. I feel much better. Okay. But, but what do you think about that and why hasn't that gotten more attention? Well, it's getting more attention now. Some of it is a problem, actually, I mean, and this, this goes back to the conversation we're having, which is, you know, uh, Part of the reason that, the ultimate part of the reason I wrote this book was, you know, nature abhors vacuums, and the media abhors vacuums, and, but it produces conspiracies to, to occupy these vacuums. And there is a conspiracy theory that the reason that we aren't in, in really looking at environmental carcinogenesis is because we don't care about it, because we actually have an invested interest in this, all this. I don't believe it. I think it is because it's a hard problem. And I'll tell you why it's a hard problem. It's a hard problem because if there is a rare environmental factor which causes a large increase in cancer risk, those are very easy to find. Asbestos and uh, lung cancer. Right. So rare exposure, not a lot of people are exposed to that level of asbestos. And the, the variant of lung cancer, particularly mesothelioma, is a rare cancer. You can pick that out. It's like having a, you know, two needles in a haystack. You, you, they, they come together in some ways. Uh, it's like having a lunar eclipse. Um, so, now, in, on the flip side, if you have a common exposure and it increases the risk very largely, you can pick those out as well. So good example is tobacco smoke. So now it's less common, but in the 50s and 60s it was a common exposure. It increased the risk of lung cancer by ninefold, tenfold, depending on the right circumstances. Those you can pick out epidemiologically. The real conundrum in environmental carcinogenesis is to find common exposures that increase risk by a small amount. Those are really hard to find. Beca and so these are things like, you know, you could ask yourself the question, is there, are there estrogen-like substances in our food, lurking in our food, which are increasing risk of breast cancer by 5%? Now you might think that 5% is not a very large number, 
But if you have 200,000 women with breast cancer, 5% becomes an extremely large number. Um, and that's a really hard, now imagine how you would do that, statistically imagine, right? So it becomes, a, it becomes an incredibly complex mathematical problem, a biological problem, because you can't, you can't get at those small increases, but very widespread increases in risk. And so that's the real challenge in environmental customization. And we think that solving, understanding cancer cells, the cell biology, will get us over the problem. Because we don't have to run a trial of 700,000 women who are exposed to estrogen-like substances, and we don't even know what the exposures were, versus 700,000 women who are not exposed, and try to find that increase in risk, which is 5%. Instead, we try to go to the cell and ask the question, is this substance doing something to the cell that's acting as a surrogate for this kind of behavior? Because cancer clusters are notoriously difficult to prove. Notoriously difficult Even prove though things. it seems to be so obvious to an outside observer when a whole slew of people in one neighborhood come down with breast cancer. And, and in fact, they've been extensively probed. There are indeed cancer clusters. Uh, often the, the reasons are complex. One cancer cluster can occur because there was a in, in consanguineous marriage in some area, and therefore they share genes. One cancer ca cluster can occur because there's a virus that is associated with cancer and that happened to spread in a neighborhood. Uh, third cancer cluster. So in other words, if you were looking at, if you were looking at, you know, if you were looking in a very false way at the HIV epidemic in the, you know, in the 1980s in, in New York City, many of the men were presenting with Kaposi's sarcoma. You would say, well, there's a cancer cluster there and it has to do with environmental carcinogen. No, it has to do with the fact that there is a behavior that exposing men, and uh, later men and women, to a virus. So you can be very misled by the idea of a cancer cluster and suspecting that there must be a lurking environmental carcinogen. It's certainly there, but we have to be clever about it. We have to be thoughtful about this. And it might just be one factor, it that, might be just one factor that, exactly. that helps tip the balance yes. of this sort of genetic mutation yes. gone haywire. Yes. Um, we're going to open it up to questions, I think, but I just have one more. Actually, I have about 10 more, but we're only going to ask one more. In terms of how cancer is being approached now. There is so much exciting technology, and it seems to be this confluence of science, technology, hopefully public advocacy is working, is, is helping to push that as well. But you have antiangiogenesis drugs that talk, take up, cut off the tumor's blood mm -hmm. supply. Is thalidomide one of those? Thalidomide is one of them. Yeah, right. and you have nanotechnology, you have monoclonal antibodies, immunotherapy, you have targeted therapy. What do you think is the most exciting thing that's happening in the field of cancer research? And how, uh, I thought it was cute that, that your doctor, I think, who oversaw you as a fellow in uh -huh. Boston, um, a guy named David Scatton, yeah. he wrote that, that you have an internal hope machine or something like that, that you're a very optimistic person uh, about cancer. And, what are you most optimistic and excited about in terms of, of treatment? Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to answer the question in two ways. I'm going to talk about treatment, but I also want to talk about advocacy. I want to talk to you about advocacy in particular. Um, so let me talk about treatment for one second. And um, what's the most exciting? Well, uh, I've been, you know, in some ways I, I am optimistic, uh, but I think we have, an we have an innovation problem in cancer right now. Um, and we need to address the innovation problem. The innovation problem is that we are beginning to understand how a cancer cell works, different cancer cells, how different cancer cells work, what the mutations are, what some of the causes are, what some of the antecedent events are, but we don't have treatments for them. It is an embarrassment. Uh, we, in other words, there are very few arenas of science where the knowledge of cause and the capacity to intervene to treat or prevent cancer has this level of discrepancy. Many, many fields of science have a poor understanding of cause, a poor understanding of pathology, pathogenesis, but also have no drugs, right? But cancer is not that. Cancer is in a very peculiar moment, and it's in, it, is a, it is a touching moment, because you go to a patient, imagine going to a patient and saying, I understand, I know, uh, not in every detail, but I know I understand what the driving cause of your cancer is, right down to the molecular level, but I cannot offer you a single piece, I can't offer you therapy, I can't offer you treatment. It is a frustrating time, it's a frustrating time. And so there are so many advances which are helping a little bit, 
but, but they're really just extending life by three or four months. Yeah, they, some of them are. Some of them are transformative. Some of them, we, some of them are doing more than extending life by three or four months. I mean, if you know, if you go back to leukemia, if you go back to Sidney Farber's example of childhood leukemia, you could say to yourself, you know, I'm going to be nihilistic about all of this, and it's you know, because every trial in those acute leukemia trials extended life by four or five months. But four or five months plus four or five months plus four or five months plus four or five months eventually equals five years, 10 years, 20 years, right? So the way out is the way through. Uh, we don't have magic solutions. We have to try things. We need people to be involved. Um, we need a national platform. We need money. Uh, and we need advocacy. Um, so uh, it's hard for me to say, you know, here's one magic substance. That's not, in fact, that there isn't. Um, th there is no single line, it depends on the cancer, there's no single line which is more interesting than the others, uh, but a combination will help and we need to find a way to make those combinations happen. Just to give you one example, for the first time in, um, in melanoma, actually, melanoma was, it, was, it, was, it, was an illness, um, was a form of cancer. When, when, when we were training as fellows, um, and we, we share, uh, your nephew was my co-fellow, um, so we have a we have a, a long connection, but when, when we were training as fellows, it was impossible to find a trainee who, who, who said, I want to be a melanoma doctor, because it was so hopeless. Well, I sit on the, uh, the admissions committee at Columbia. Two out of every five uh, young men and women who want to be fellows in cancer uh, want to do melanoma. In the span of five or 10 years, it has changed so dramatically because there are two new, there are two new medicines. And for the first time, uh, in the history, as, of, as far as I can tell, of, of this arena, two pharmaceutical companies have decided that they're going to take their fledgling drugs and combine them in a clinical trial. I mean, due to efforts of people like Deborah and, and various other people, they have, brought, uh, they have brought a platform such that, you know, this bickering between pharmaceutical companies, the protection of single drugs can be overcome and they can come about and share resources and really move the field forward. Uh, this is, as I said, this is not someone else's problem. Uh, the CEO of those two pharmaceutical companies has first degree relatives, if not himself or herself, who will be affected by one of these forms of cancer. So there is a personal investment, there is an advocacy investment, and that's changing. That, that, that's what makes me optimistic. Long answer. No, that's okay. I think we have some questions. Um, identify yourself. Uh, well, William like Hazeltine. My question is one I think everybody in the audience and who thinks about cancer has, which is how fast will there be cures for most cancers, in your opinion? I don't think that all cancers will be curable. I think we will cure some, we will prevent some, we will treat some, uh, and some we will convert into chronic diseases. I think that bar is high enough. <laughs> I think that, that is already setting the bar very high. Um, and I think, you know, if we, could, if we could tackle the problem in this way uh, without promising the kind of cures that were promised in the 1970s, I think we can move the field forward. Now, you know, 500 years from now, will they laugh at us because, you know, we were mixing primitive poisons and surgery and, and radiation to cure cancer? They probably will. I hope so. Um, but I suspect that, that it's not going to be a simple answer. It's going to be a patchwork answer. Uh, some cures, some treatments some prevention, um, and extension of life, valuable extension of life, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Yes? Um, Barbara Hertz, my father's doctor saw her who discovered radioactive iodine and is used in the cure for thyroid cancer. That's and pretty cool. Can I just say that? Yeah. Well, I have to tell you something. It's been a long journey for me, as the doctor knows, in terms of uh, getting his recognition in that uh, he discovered this in the late 1940s when he came back from the Manhattan Project um, serving in the Navy. And he was at Mass General Hospital, and I have to make note that he was one of two Jews in the entire hospital. And at the time in the late 1930s, yeah. there was a high degree of anti-Semitism. Right, it was verboten. Couldn't, couldn't join the faculty. No, couldn't join the faculty. There were quotas in medical school. He went to Harvard Medical School. But uh, my question for you is, how is this so unique and a treatment that has lasted for 70 years? And is there any hope of this medi medicine or the type of treatment that he developed in treating other types of cancer? Uh, 
you know, thyroid, uh, first of all, thank you for your father for inventing this. This actually saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of men and women. Um, the, the, the answer is thyroid cancer. That particular variant of thyroid cancer is very unique. Um, and it's because the thyroid happens to concentrate iodine. The thyroid happens to be a unique organ in our body which takes iodine and sucks it up and puts it inside it. It concentrates iodine. It's a little bag of iodine. And therefore, uh, if you make radioactive iodine, it becomes like a Trojan horse. Um, and it goes into the thyroid, and the Trojan horse, and because it's carrying radioactivity, will bombard the thyroid with radioactivity and thereby cure some of these variants of thyroid cancer. So you, it's hard to imagine that exactly the same idea is going to apply to other cancers. But the principle of the Trojan horse, which is to somehow load a payload, an antibody, uh, to payload a chemical to get into an organ and then deliver specifically uh, toxic therapy uh, or even non-toxic therapy to that organ comes from this idea, comes from your father's, so there's a lineage in this. And it's actually now becoming very, very common to look for these kinds of... Uh, you should write, have you written about your dad? Because I think you should write a piece about it, and, about him and put it in the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. both of you for your uh, comments and, and the presentation this evening. You talked about needing more money. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about sort of exactly where you think the money will be, would be most useful and is most needed. I think many of us kind of assume that, especially compared to other medical conditions, cancer is kind of well-funded, well-known, lots of organizations, et cetera. So where in the sort of process uh, is the money needed? Is it basic research? Is it translational? It, uh, so the answer is, it's needed for every level. Um, it is primarily needed for innovation. It, 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 money generates the innovative, innovation cycle. Uh, to me, when I, the, the, the most, for me, the most moving things I read, uh, testimonies uh, about my book, is when a young trainee comes and says, I got inspired to go into oncology or into cancer research because I read this book. That is to me, that, that is a job. That is a job done for me. Because um, that is what, the purpose of, of all of this was, to some extent. Um, people have come up to me and said, you know, I was going to, I was going to, I, I was going to do something else. I was going to be a banker. Um, but I have decided Thank to be God. a banker. <laughs> exactly. Just kidding. I love bankers. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> but I decided to go into oncology. To me, that is a, a moving testimony of, of the power to influence young men and women's minds. Um, because if they're not going to be doing the inventing, who's going to be doing, be doing the inventing? So, but it requires a, a broad investment um, and a kind of investment that transcends multiple levels, all the way from the National Cancer Institute, uh, all the way down to the all the way down to training individual trainees through grants, through foundational grants, etc. Um, I want to say two words, which are in, two, 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 two ideas, which are interesting to me. One is the idea. I was looking through the records. I was visiting the uh, NIH and the NCI, and I was thinking about how moving and how transformative is the idea of taking a public health service whose job was to protect Americans really from immigration, from outside, from the diseases brought about by uh, immigrants coming from outside, which is really the conception of the public health service, and to turn the idea of protection around and say protection is about ourselves. Uh, to say that the, 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 the job of the National Institute of Health is security. It used to be the, idea, the old idea of security which is security uh, threats from outside, to turn it around and say, you know, really security, and I'm reading that word from uh, right up there, you know, uh, in future days which we, make to, which, which, we, which we seek to make secure, security is about health. You know, what, what manner of security could you give anyone if it wasn't the security of good health? That idea is, to me, a profoundly American idea. Uh, to be able to turn it around and to say the threat is not from us, let's really look inside and, and find where, how we can make security happen. And that's the idea I would put out in, in, to each every one of us and say, what is your sense? Where would you think your, your money is best spent in order to secure your, the lives of yourself and the lives of your children? Is it in clinical research? Um, then give money to clinical research. Is it in basic research? I mean, you follow your drive everywhere and I think, and the answer will be there. It, it, it has to do with uh, 
creating innovative ways to think around a problem that is of enormous consequence to humanity. Part of the problem is, can I just chime yeah. in here, is that government funding has pretty much flatlined in recent years and it hasn't kept up with the pace of inflation. Also, only one in 10 promising research proposals is funded by the NCI. So a lot of these scientists, young researchers, spend months coming up with these proposals and nine of them end up on the cutting room floor. And so that's why I think a lot of private individuals and philanthropists cancer. and other organizations have decided, you know, yes, you think that it's, it's really well funded, but it, it really doesn't get the funding it deserves. So I'm going to make a shameless plug for Stand Up to Cancer you just do. because we changed the paradigm of how research is being conducted. So uh, about uh, four years, four or five years ago, some we say hell has, hath no fury like some pissed off women. And a bunch of us got together, Sherry Lansing in LA, Laura Ziskin, who passed away uh, recently from breast cancer, who was a very renowned Hollywood sure producer and wonderful person who did Spider-Man and all these other movies. She was uh, dealing with breast cancer at the time and some other, the Entertainment Industry Foundation, which is the philanthropic arm of Hollywood, we decided that we wanted to bring more attention to cancer. So we started doing these televised events biannually. Every other year we do these shows that were on all the networks. The whole Hollywood community would come out. We got a lot of corporate sponsors and basically raised $180 million so far for cancer research. But we didn't want to just throw it out. We wanted to do it strategically and intelligently. And I noticed through my cancer advocacy work that cancer research is very proprietary and still very competitive and political like everything in life, what isn't political. So we, did a, we have a mandate that these scientists have to actually work together from various institutions. And so they form what we call dream teams that actually have to share information, resources, experience, even tissue samples so we can move science faster. And they have to have, uh, it has to go from the lab to a clinical trial in three years rather than 11 years, which is the typical amount of time it takes from trying to come up with a new drug and then actually using it on patients. So at first, the doctors and scientists and researchers were a little threatened by this whole new paradigm. They didn't want to necessarily share their yeah. research. And then they became incredibly galvanized and, or sort of really jazzed about the whole prospect and it really gave them a whole new lease on life. Our, we have a scientific advisory board, we deal with the American Association of Cancer Researchers and one of the interesting things about the grant process is Phil Sharp, who's a Nobel laureate from MIT, heads the, the committee, is there's a lot of interactivity between the scientists who are applying for the grants and the people who, stand up to cancer giving the grants and when you do something for the NCI there's very little interaction where a, where a scientist can really question the researcher on sort of all those complicated scientific things that I don't really understand. So anyway, so, so they are actually making really exciting progress. I just went to a meeting in Florida. We have a pancreatic cancer dream team and they're starting to see life expectancy for pancreatic cancer patients increase. We have a lung cancer mm -hmm. dream team. We have epigenetics, which Sid will explain better than I will, which is sort of, I'll try, the messaging, sort of the out, external messaging mm -hmm. that's outside a cell that's sort of messaging, signaling the DNA to behave a certain way. Yes. That's epigenetics, epigenetics, I always say it wrong. And um, so it's really, really exciting. And I think that hopefully we'll see more of this collaboration in the future because I think it it, it gives, it motivates people, yes. and, and I think and, it's... And it's, it's nucleated a whole series of, of, of various, you know, various other projects. Uh, two come to mind. We talked a little bit about the Melanoma Research Alliance. The myeloma. Have you have a dream team, too, exactly. Yeah. yeah. The mel are you with... Yeah, we just yes. started it, the Melanoma yes. Dream Team. Woo! And the myeloma, <laughs> the and myeloma uh, also run... By the way, I was, talking, I was asking Katie, where are all the men? These, these advocacy, right from Mary Lasker onwards, these dream teams have been spearheaded by women advocates. I mean, there are some men, I'm sorry if I am saying something horribly politically incorrect, but. Oh, oh <laughs> I hate that, Sid. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. You mentioned the two approved drugs that are being used in collaboration. Um, so one of the things that we haven't addressed is, 
how do you get unapproved drugs Yes. Not to take 12 years and billions of dollars. So even if the drug's promising, if there's no financial payback at some point with the company, they're going to let it go. Yes. And also, uh, the patents, they won't extend them. And how do you get uh, drug companies not to feel they'll be penalized if they use unapproved compounds that they've committed a lot of time, money, effort, etc. So, so, so this actually is a very important question because it gets to the question of changing the landscape of how we imagine drugs being approved, how clinical trials happen. And this is not a scientific question. This ultimately is a question about how we influence lawmakers and what the new paradigm is going to be. Now, from the standpoint of the science, from the standpoint of the clinical trials, we, we're trying to invent new clinical trials. The old model of a clinical trial was what I call the try, try, try again model, which is, you know, you, you enroll... 2,000 patients and you see a difference of three months. So then you enroll 10,000 patients and you see a difference of three and a half months. And then you enroll 50,000 patients and you see a difference of three and a half months plus four days, right? That's the old model. The new model, which is now being tried, has several components. Number one, first component is, so the new model is fail fast and fail early, which is you might think is counterintuitive to a pharmaceutical company, but it's in fact the new model, which is 90% of the medicines that, that we you think are going to work are not going to work. And instead of spending billions of dollars on these medicines that will ultimately not really make a difference, let them fail early. Do small trials, do pilot studies, and fail them. Fail them, fail them, so that then you can get behind the medicines that really do work. And therefore, you can really capitalize on real things that make a real difference to human biology. So that's a, that's a complete change in the way we run and think about trials. Point number two, rather than finishing a massive trial and going backwards, and this is actually a, a, a one of the dream teams is trying to do this, rather than finishing a trial and going backwards and figuring out who, who responded, who didn't respond, try to build in what are called self-learning trials, which is during the trial itself, during the clinical trial itself, the trial is learning what it's doing by feeding back the data. It's blinded still, but feeding back the data. It's, imagine it's like a computer that learns as it moves along. So these are, these are some of the innovative ideas which actually have to do not only with inventing new chemicals or new biologicals, but have to do with the structure of trials, changing the way we imagine statistics. Uh, that's an important contribution. Changing the way we imagine patent law, it's an important contribution. So there's a vast amount of things to be done. Let me just, let me just say one last thing about, about the, the nature of the funding. We always think that this is big money. There's a word, you know, cancer equals big money. The annual budget of the National Cancer Institute is $5 billion. What does $5 billion get? The air conditioning bill of the war in the Middle East was more than $5 billion. The oil subsidies in the United States, the subsidies for oil in the United States are nearly twice $5 billion. The annual, the monthly spending of the, uh, the United States Army in the Gulf per month in 2008, per month, was greater than the combined budget of the National Cancer Institute and the Food and Drug Administration. Every month we spend more on keeping an armed, uh, keeping armed forces in the Gulf than we spend combined the annual budgets of the National Cancer Institute plus the annual budget of the Food and Drug Administration. So we're talking about money. These are important numbers. But let's not lose perspective of what that money is. Well, <clears throat> those are certainly statistics that we will all keep in mind. Uh, just as Katie had, I think, 10 questions she didn't, uh, wasn't able to ask and said that she could have stayed here all evening, uh, I, I can assure you that all of us here in the audience could have and would like to stay here all evening. But unfortunately, we cannot. Uh, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing anything. <laughs> Uh, no, it was absolutely Thanks scintillating, so uh, inspiring. Uh, we're very lucky to have both of you part of the Aspen family, and we thank all of you for being here this evening. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie.